You are welcome to this preview of a men's Bible study of the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 20 through 29, reading from the Legacy Standard Bible, with 5th century or earlier manuscript variants inserted between square brackets. Learning objectives for this session include the following. By the end of the session, participants will be able to define and distinguish church and Israel. Participants will meet the condition for receiving everlasting glory or eternal life. Participants will rejoice in afflictions suffered because of their faith in Messiah Jesus. We're following a semantic structure of the book suggested by the work of John Callow, focusing on these points. The discussion outline has brought us to chapter 1, verse 21. He has reconciled you. How Paul endures hardship on behalf of the believers, even rejoicing in his sufferings. Some pertinent background material on this epistle and this section. The Colossian Christians were troubled by local Jews who taught that, in order to be saved, believers must adopt certain Jewish customs and rituals, which included worship of God through angelic mediators. Christian evangelists, however, had taught them that they could be saved by faith alone in Messiah Jesus, crucified to forgive sins, and raised back to life, who promised glory, or eternal life, upon his return when he would raise them back to life. Thus the Christians were troubled by the promises of Jesus, which seemed to conflict with requirements of Jews who happened to be God's chosen people. So which should they believe? Well, Paul affirms that God has reconciled you. If you are studying alone, stop the video and read this verse carefully. If you are studying in a group, then ask someone to read these verses aloud. There is a grammatical problem at the beginning of the verse. Although you were formerly alienated, but now he is not good Greek grammar, nor is it good English grammar. Therefore, we suggest as an alternative translation that the pronoun you in verse 21 harks back to earlier in the chapter and could be translated even you with a full stop after evil deeds, then a new sentence and new paragraph, but now he. We have a Hendiades with alienated and enemies, perhaps translatable as enemy aliens. More on alienation in the next slide. After others have made their observations of this verse and posed their queries, you might want to ask, what leads to enmity with God? Let others answer the query from the text. And then, what reverses enmity with God? Again, find answers in the text. This verse has a parallel in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, where Paul wrote, Remember that you were at that time without Christ, alienated from the citizenship of Israel, and therefore strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without the God of the Bible, during your life in the world. Well, what is Israel? There are several ways to look at Israel. Israel was a nation, having land, boundaries, a citizenship, it was a kingdom. However, Israel was also ethnic, having a self-identity as followers of Yahweh, a common heritage, shared customs, and strict laws about food. Israel is also a religion, having a temple, synagogues, holy scriptures, and celebrating holy feasts. There is also cultural Israel, a people who share a worldview, beliefs about reality, shared values, 
and especially valuing Hebrew language. Then there is social Israel, consisting of priests, social classes, levels of status, definite laws, and social institutions. Finally, there is spiritual Israel, that is, the community of those who remain loyally faithful to Yahweh, expecting Messiah and hoping for glory, that is, eternal life. Well, how do Israel and church overlap? Here are five common views. There is the Catholic view, which makes the church equal to Israel, maintaining Israel's priesthood, asserting, therefore, that there be no salvation outside of Israel, that is, outside of the Catholic Church. Protestant Christians, however, generally equate the church with spiritual Israel, that is, Israel that has faith in Messiah Jesus. Dispensationalists, who are usually evangelical Christians, maintain the church in Israel remain distinct and separate, for God has a different eschatology for each of them. Messianic Christians will often tell us that Israel are the historic people of God, whilst the church are all who believe in Israel's God, Jew or Gentile. In the Pauline view, the church equals true Israel, meaning all those who remain faithful to Yahweh and to Messiah Jesus, including Jews and Gentiles. Back to the book of Colossians. Have someone read aloud verse 23. The condition begins with the phrase, if indeed. More on that in the next slide. After others have made their observations, you might ask, what hope does the gospel offer? Gospel meaning the New Testament message. Shall we translate every creature or all creation? The phrase all creation is intended to be inclusive of all kinds of creatures, especially both Jews and Gentiles. Paul here calls himself a minister, the same word translated deacons. A deacon is one who meets urgent needs, whether physical, spiritual, or both. What danger was threatening the Colossians? And to whom does the gospel not apply? Well, those who are not under heaven. Therefore, it does not apply to angelic or divine creatures. The conditional sentence has implications for the doctrine of eternal security. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope that the gospel offers you. Grammatically, if indeed is in the indicative mood, emphasizing that it is presently true, but it's contingent upon continuing in the present tense, which means not being moved away from your hope. Well then, what is it that we hope for? Discuss all that Jesus has promised to those who remain faithful to him. What is the only condition placed upon our hope? Well, it's to continue in the faith. That is, loyal faith. You are eternally secure as long as you maintain your loyal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was enduring hardship, but he understood that he was doing so on behalf of all believers. Have someone read aloud verses 24 and 25. Note that the term afflictions, Greek thalipsis, is never used in the New Testament for Jesus' suffering on the cross. Therefore, it's dealing with something else. Here are two options. Paul may have been saying that just as Christ endured affliction, so those who serve him will also be afflicted. Secondly, he may be affirming that he is now experiencing the troubles that Jesus had foretold that he must endure. The phrase 
The church in this context is interesting. The Greek is he ekklesia, that is, the assembly. This exact phrase is used 18 times in the Greek First Testament, always of Israel, that is, believing Israelites worshiping Yahweh. We understand that stewardship is a biblical word meaning responsibility of management. Paul understood that we must give account to God for the opportunities that he has entrusted to us. The phrase translated preaching here does not exist in the original Greek. Paul was simply saying that I might fulfill the word of God, or grammatically possible that you might fulfill the word of God, that is, accomplish that which God has promised. Continue on with verses 26 and 27, reading them aloud. Note that saints, literally holy ones, in the Bible usually refers to heavenly beings surrounding God's throne. In other words, God is revealing something to the divine beings in the heavenly places, as he had noted in Ephesians 3.10. The phrase here, Christ in you, in Greek, occurs right after the phrase, among the Gentiles. So we could translate, among the Gentiles, that is, amongst you. Because of these translation difficulties, as a general guideline, when scripture seems obtuse, difficult, or illogical, translators have probably been inserting their preferred theology. Many commentators note the verbs of revelation used in these verses. God is making his message manifest, that is, very clear, bringing it to light. He's making it known so that we might perceive it. And we then proclaim it, that others may share in the revelation, and we teach it carefully. As a result, we have the nouns of revelation, which include wisdom, understanding, full knowledge, and experiential knowledge. Have someone read aloud verses 28 and 29. Note the phrase, Every man translates the Greek anthropos, which has no gender. In other words, every individual. But in this context, Paul likely means both to Jews and to Gentiles, both to women and to men, both to slave and to free. All wisdom. In other words, dear Colossians, you don't need anybody else's so-called wisdom, their imaginary approaches to God, or their insistence upon experiences, self-denial, or other human and non-human mediators, none other than Jesus Christ. So, both Jews and Gentiles become complete in Christ, having all they need by their loyal faith in Messiah Jesus, which remains all that God requires for us to attain eternal glory. God works through telling the gospel to save folk by faith alone. And to this day, this remains our privilege as well. To conclude your study, you might ask, what is one truth, insight, belief, or action that you learned from this passage this week? Before our next study session, let us read a chapter of Colossians each day in versions that we trust, and then find in Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, all that Christ has done for us human beings to be saved forever.